This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this rules workshop. This meeting is being recorded. The documents which will be discussed here today are available on our event calendar on our website, which is wmc.wa.gov. I am Amelia Boyd, and I am the program manager for the Medical Commission. So if you are not speaking, please make sure your line is muted. Um, for the most part, the panelists will leave their line open. And then for those of you joining us via the GoToMeeting platform, the chat is open for comments. If you are joining us via the telephone, please speak up if you have any comments. And then please refrain from making inappropriate comments or you will be removed from the meeting. So at this time, I would like to call on the panelists and the staff to introduce themselves. I see that Dr. Roberts is here, if you'd go ahead. I'm, I'm Alden Roberts. Uh, my background is in general surgery and I'm a commission member. And then I see Melanie is here. Hello, I'm Melanie DeLeon. I'm the executive director of the uh, commission. And then Christine, if you'd go ahead and introduce yourself. I sure will. Good afternoon. My name is Christine Blake. I'm a public member and I'll be the presiding officer for this rules workshop. And then Tracy, if you'd go ahead and introduce yourself. Tracy Drake, I am the program manager for the Board of Osteopathic Medicine and Surgery. And then I see Heather is there. Yeah, this is Heather Carter. I'm an assistant attorney general and I'm legal advisor for the commission and the um, board of osteopathic medicine. And then Dr. Small. Hi, this is Bob Small. My background is psychiatry and I'm a commission member. And then Mr. Farrell, please. Uh, I'm Mike Farrell. I'm the policy development manager for the medical commission. And then Renee, if you'd go ahead and introduce yourself. Good afternoon, I'm Renee Fullerton, Executive Director for the Board of Osteopathic Medicine and Surgery. And then let's see, Ariel, if you'd go ahead and introduce yourself as well. I'm Ariel Page Landstrom, Supervising Staff Attorney for the Medical Commission. And then I think we are waiting for one Commissioner. No, it looks like we have three. Okay, so Christine, if you'd like to go ahead and read the script, that would be great. I sure will. Today is Friday, October 9th, 2020, and it is 1.03 p.m. This meeting is being held via the GoToMeeting platform. I'd like to say a few words about today's workshop. The rule being considered today is regarding telemedicine. Please do not interrupt individuals who are speaking. If you are not comfortable speaking in front of the group, please use the chat feature to provide your comments. The purpose of this workshop is to solicit comments for the proposed rule. The rules package was filed in the Washington State Register as 1919072 on September 17, 2019. Are there any questions about the rule or the workshop process? Okay, hearing none, at this time we'll, we will review and discuss the written comments we have received. So the first comment we have is from the Americans for Vision Care Innovation. This comment was provided in the packet, so if you would like to discuss um, this particular comment, you can go ahead. I don't know if this is the appropriate time for the public to speak up, but my name is Brent Ludeman. I'm a contract lobbyist and uh, was uh, responsible for some commissions on behalf of, Mission, for Americans for Vision Care Innovation. Americans for Vision Care Innovation is a coalition of think, uh, think tanks, advocacy groups, and uh, vision care companies who compete against each other. We've reviewed the language and have submitted four uh, proposed edits uh, for your consideration, and would love to to walk through those with you if if uh, if it's so if I if I can. <clears throat> the the first uh, 
changes uh, the definition of store and forward technology. Um, you will see in the, the proposed rule that uh, the term covered person is used twice. Uh, this language comes directly from the 2015 uh, telemedicine reimbursement law. Our concern is that covered person only applies to individuals who are using insurance. Uh, most contact lens customers are not using insurance. We believe these rules should, uh, should focus on the practice of telemedicine while allowing reimbursement, insurance, uh, and compensation issues to be uh, addressed in a different forum. Similarly, the definition of tele or, uh, the definition of practice of medicine also refers to the practitioner receiving compensation in some form. This language again comes from the 2015 telemedicine reimbursement law. We don't believe that the proposed rule should focus on compensation, but should focus entirely on the practice of medicine. Third, we would ask that the definition of telemedicine also include store and forward technology. In the policy statement issued by the commission in 2018, there were definitions for both and then states the term telemedicine includes both telemedicine and store and forward technology. We believe this suggested edit is consistent with that guidance as an important clarification to the proposed rules. Finally, and I, I think you'll hear this a lot today, uh, the practitioner patient relationship as defined on page three of the rules uh, is different from the, the guidance that's been previously issued by this commission and the definition of telemedicine uh, in the RCW. Specifically, it requires direct and real-time communication. In addition to our existing telemedicine laws, both the American Medical Association an American Telemedicine Association recognized that the practitioner-patient relationship can be established by asynchronous technologies. Our suggested edit clarifies that the practitioner-patient relationship can be established through store and forward technology. Alternatively, the commission could just go back to its previously issued guidance by removing, quote, through direct and real-time communication as defined in statute in the proposed rule. Thank you for your time and consideration of these proposed edits, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So this is Alden Roberts. Uh, I think those edits are all points well taken. And it's hard to address this sort of an issue without actually seeing it written down. I, I haven't gotten the, I don't have your letter up, but even if we did, it would need to be in the, uh, in the uh, rules that we're looking at. And I actually think I'd like to hear other the, some of the other commissioners comment, but it seems to me as though most of what was commented upon are valid concerns. So the uh, Mr. Commissioner, the the proposed uh, language from us is included in that letter. I don't know if if you received that letter or not, but uh, our proposed language is included there. I did see it, and I did review it um, and it, and so I, I understand. I, I let me. I can bring it up. It's going to take me a minute to get it up to see where we are here. In the meantime, do any other commissioners have any thoughts or comments on this? Because to me, it, this this all made sense when I read it in the first place, and it makes sense when I hear it now. It's Chris Blake, and I, I agree. When I read this, it made sense to me as well, Alden. Hi, this is Kim Morissette. I'm a emergency physician and board member of the Osteopathic Medical Board, and I also agree with these edits. Thank you. This is uh, Jimmy Anderson, uh, Commissioner, and I would uh, join the choir and, and say I, I also think these are very rational and they make a lot of sense. I, I appreciate the, the edit, edits. Thank you. Thank you. 
I've got a question. My name is Albert Wirtz. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I've just recently started doing private practice with telemedicine. The store and forward technology, does that require uh, you to subscribe to an EMR service or is that, uh, can you still, if you include that technology, can you still just see patients through Zoom and manage your own database locally on your PC or does that change it to where you have to subscribe to an EMR service? And again, this is Alden Roberts. So as I read the rules uh, as we as were proposed, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question other than to say um, that appropriate medical records are required. And now maybe I'm missing the point when I say that. So I'm open to anybody who wishes to counter what I just said. But under definition of appropriate, we purposely didn't get super defining. This is Kim Morissette. As I reviewed the rules and also the suggestions, I understood that there's synchronous and then the asynchronous portion via the store and forward technology. It didn't have to be both. I don't believe that it's requiring store and forward. You can still have um, synchronous uh, telemedicine consultation without doing the store and forward, but it's allowing for the store and forward as well. Is that correct? That would be my interpretation. Um, this is Erica Bliss, and uh, I'm a family physician. Is it okay if I ask a question? Sure. So a couple of questions, and I'm sorry if I, I had to join just a couple minutes late. I don't know if this has been explained. Um, I am in private practice and do quite a bit of telemedicine. And uh, I have a couple questions about the definition of telemedicine. Um, it, it's a little bit confusing to me because telemedicine does not include the use of audio only tele telephone, uh, email or facsimile is fine, but um, telephone, um, is that truly not part of telemedicine? Because there are a lot of patients who don't have adequate um, bandwidth to do um, video or extended video. Um, and so, especially with COVID, it has been necessary to do quite a bit by telephone. Um, I don't personally have a practice that has to worry about billing insurance so that, you know, having to deal mm -hmm. with insurance billing requirements is not an issue. Um, and I know this is not referring to compensation, but the reality is a lot of people don't have stable communications except by, tele by telephone. So it seems like this is pretty exclusionary. Um, and and uh, it, it's really a socioeconomic issue or, or a rural urban issue. Um, so I wanted to bring that up. This is a pretty serious issue for a lot of people, especially in our state. Well, I, this is, again, this is Alden Roberts. I, I am concerned that um, there is a significant difference between being able to see somebody and not being able to see somebody in terms of doing an assessment. I'm not sure that any telephone call constitutes tele telemedicine. And I understand what you're saying. I think that's a valid point. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I kind of like to hear what others think about this, but I'm a little concerned about opening it up too much to just a telephone uh, call. And again, part of that is, of that is because could... my background is in general surgery, not in family practice. Let me clarify my question too. Are we talking about just the establishing of a care relationship or a follow-up care? Is this, is this just to establish a, a provider patient care relationship or follow-up care? I'm not okay. sure I understand your question. This is a rule, this is a rule to determine the regulation of telemedicine. That can because be established care or follow-up care, either one. Okay, because there's there's also an issue here, again, in my experience of practicing telemedicine. In, in establishing care with the patient, yes, I would agree that <clears throat> just having a phone call with somebody, you don't know who you're talking to, you don't know their situation. Um, it, it's a little more iffy that you know who you're talking to. Um, and it takes some creativity to figure that out. 
Um, and generally, I don't establish care with somebody and haven't done so under COVID without some sort of visualization of the patient. Um, Follow-up care, however, um, by phone is not unreasonable to do and can be done safely. And in talking to my primary care colleagues around the country, that's what a lot of us are having to do. And in order for people to actually get care, um, that is what we're having to do. And frankly, a lot of care doesn't require hands-on or even eyeballs on people um, to follow up. And um, you know, there's a lot of care we can direct people to do. So I think it's important to distinguish between the establishing of a doctor-patient relationship or care, you know, clinician-patient relationship and follow-up care. So, pardon my uh, name. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> how this is different from what we've been doing for the past since the telephone came out. So uh, this is uh, Bob Smoff. I can make a couple comments. Um, so, and, and you know, my field, as you know, all in psychiatry is vastly different from surgery. Um, wow. But but I was going to make some comments ab about this also. Um, so there is a considerable amount of live interactive treatment being done just by telephone and psychiatry. Uh, in addition to that. There is uh, actually quite a bit of therapy being done by texting. There's a, a rather prominent organization out of New York um, called Talkspace that promotes uh, therapy by texting. Uh, it's not something I'm particularly in favor of, but I think um, possibly to Erica's point, as a commission, we need to consider whether we need to bring those audio only practices under the rule or let them go completely unregulated, so to speak. Uh, so, I, uh, you know, my bias is obviously in favor of incorporating those, but I just want to mention that, you know, that is going on, even though, you know, obviously doing surgery, that would, you know, be extremely problematic. But and if I could throw in one more, one more thing, I'm sorry. Asynchronous I, communication. Excuse me, I'm the commissioner and I need to talk to Mr. Small. Thank you. Sorry. Bob, um, yes. I don't see that I understand the difference between what you're talking about and what we've done for years. Because in surgery, we have taken care of people. We've heard people on the phone. We prescribe medications to them on the phone. We've told them to go to the hospital on the phone. We've tried to manage their problems. We've made recommendations. And I don't see how this is different from what we've done for years. Now, there is a difference as it relates to billing, but that's not what we're supposed to be doing here. Yes, yeah, so I think the, the difference is all that, it, and I definitely hear your point, uh, but in psychiatry and mental health, we are having entire episodes of care that are done just through audio contact. Uh, you, you know, uh, in, in surgery, to use as an example, Obviously, you do the surgery in person, even if there's a lot of follow-up that's done through telephonic contact. But we now have whole episodes of care uh, in psychiatry and mental health where there's no visual contact at all. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that I personally favor that, but we just need to be aware of that and decide if we want to bring that under this umbrella or not. Great. Thank you. Uh, this Hi, is, this is uh, 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 sorry, let me just, <clears throat> mine, mine's quick, I think. This is Jimmy Anderson, Commissioner. Um, so there was a question earlier about uh, store and forward technology, and I'm a little new to the game, too, as far as what exactly that means, and I've read about it a little bit. Um, but the question was, to do store and forward uh, technology, does that mean you have to have a, a EHR to do that? And, and perhaps um, someone here who knows more than me might be able to address this um, if it would be deemed appropriate. But uh, my understanding is store and forward does require, it doesn't require a whole separate EHR, but it does require some technology and which, which is not, which can be, um, which can be costly. I mean, it, it can be, um, it's not free. Um, is that a, is, is, is that a correct, um, answer to the question someone asked about, do you need a whole separate EHR for it? But yeah, um, my uh, my current setup is I do create electronic medical records and I store them locally on my encrypted hard drive. 
Um, but uh, so storing forward is not required for me to keep. I, I basically got a digital patient record on my own PC that's encrypted. Uh, I, I don't really want it to be tied into having to subscribe to an EHR. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're, we're not doing that. Commissioner Anderson, this is Micah Matthews, if I could respond to, to that a little bit. Um, as someone who's been working on the guidelines, the policy, and now this rule, I don't think there's ever been a, a thought or intention that this rule would, would require anyone to subscribe to any service, let alone, let alone an EHR. Um, the, these rules are intended to be general, uh, and, and when they're including certain technology types and not others, it's not so much saying that you can't practice that way. It's simply saying for the purpose of our definition or this rule or what we are going to choose to look at, that would be included. So to, to address the telemedicine uh, with, with telephone only, uh, that I believe at the time was actually the definition and statute. And so that is what we chose to cling to because that was the clearest guidance we had uh, at the time of what uh, telemedicine would be defined as. So I hope that helps clarify some. Again, this is a rules workshop, so uh, should the commission and uh, by extension the osteopathic board choose to coalesce around a different definition, that's that's entirely uh, their prerogative. Thank you. Um, sorry, this is uh, Karen Baker. I'm the risk manager at Public Health Seattle and King County and just wanted to chime in on this um, the, tel the definition. Um, I guess first it would be helpful if, if I, to have the site to that statute, because um, I'm ignorant and don't know what it is. Um, and then also, um, I'm just thinking about implementing this. Um, and um, I do think um, it's confusing um, on first glance to understand um, why te telephone um, would not be included um, once, um, if the medical if if the rule would be made to provide guidance in the area of telemedicine, why it wouldn't make sense to include telephone. Um, and I, as a matter of practice, it seems like it would create a lot more questions, um, at least just speaking for our public health practitioners, um, about um, what should apply to just those telephone meetings if it was excluded. And it would be, from a practical matter, easier to have them all have the same uh, guidance. Thanks. This is... This is Brian Ludeman again. I um, I just want to uh, clarify where that language came from because we've done a fair amount of research on this over the course of the last few weeks. Um, the language around audio only telephone uh, facility or, or email is actually directly from the 2015 telemedicine reimbursement law. And it's also in the um, policy statement that the commission adopted in 2018. So that, that specific language um, is in the RCW, and it's and it's in the, the policy statement that uh, this commission adopted two years ago. Hi, this is Kim Morissette. As an emergency physician, this throughout the pandemic, there's been a lot of changes in how we approach following up patients and giving them access to care that doesn't involve them coming back into a a, a medical structure per se, and we often will discharge patients with COVID or um, high risk for COVID that have presented for care with a follow-up via a uh, some type of texting modality that includes a home pulse, ox, pulse oximeter where they're checked in with a, um, I think it's a nurse, I'm not sure exactly who's on the other side of that, but it's a way to monitor patients that we're otherwise concerned about. And I think in this regard, we need to meet the need of the patients at where they are and not all of our patients have access to a video monitor to you know do a facetime if you will uh telemedicine consultation and so i think that audio is important and while i agree commissioner that how is that different from you know the telephone and following up with patients by phone i think the pandemic has changed how we look at allowing patients to have access to care. And I think it's important to allow the audio be um, included in this for ensuring that all of our patients have appropriate access. 
Well, again, as it relates to audio, that's available now and it's been available for years. The question is, do we need to make a new rule that includes audio when it's been going on for years? And that's not clear to me. Uh, nobody's trying to say that you can't do these sorts of things with patients. Text is included in here, and text is interesting because in the past, we've been concerned about the security of text messages. So uh, I think I think texting is certainly valid. Telephone may be valid. I'm just expressing one opinion um, because you certainly are doing things differently now than we did before. But again, this is a regulatory rule, and we've been able to use the telephone for years. Uh, this is Randall Dixon. I'm a PA. I work in telemedicine. And I have to tell you that seniors feel really uh, uncomfortable and confused by trying to use video. And we have to use telephone with them the majority of times. And so I understand what you just said, Commissioner, but I think the point that we're trying to make is that we should not exclude it out of this ruling that is um, before us. Thank you. Um, this is Erica Bliss again, if I could uh, make another comment along those lines. I think what, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the, the rules, it, it seemed to me that there was an issue of the establishing of a relationship between the provider and the patient um, that seems restrictive to me. And perhaps I'm misunderstanding that. Um, uh, so it said, when practicing telemedicine, a practitioner must establish a practitioner-patient relationship with the patient through a direct and real-time communication. Um, and uh, that questionnaires or asynchronous communication is not adequate. Um, so, or other forms of communication. So I, I think what, what some of us are kind of trying to say is that in the current, you know, in current in the current climate with COVID, but also given modern technologies and also good research and experience out there that shows that very excellent patient care can occur um, for certain kinds of conditions and certain kinds of um, uh, procedures and and you know as the other uh, physician stated for mental health care, there's some very innovative, uh, very good care going on there that. Um, has been accomplished this way. I don't think that we in this state should constrain that. Um, there are ways of establishing um, a, a relationship with good protocols. I mean, telemedicine organizations have been doing this for several years now. And I feel like some of this is, is constraining that in a way that would take some steps back from that. So that's concerning to me. This is Elisa Wells. I'm a Washington State resident and I'd like to speak from a patient perspective. Um, I agree with what Dr. Bliss just said that um, we do have technology. We have many ways to use technology and we should take full advantage of that technology to enable healthcare and also to enable equity in healthcare. And I will give you an example that happened to me just this morning as I was trying to help my 87 year old mom have a consultation with a new doctor who's an oncology specialist. And they were going to either force her to come in, which would you know, cost her hundreds of dollars to arrange for transportation because she doesn't drive, or they said she could do a video visit. But then they said she couldn't, couldn't have an appointment um, if she couldn't do one or the other of those things. And I said, why can't she just talk to you on the telephone? Well, it's a first person, you know, first visit with a doctor, we can't do that. And I said, sure you can. It's a pandemic. She's 87 years old and she doesn't have the technology. And so they did it. It enabled me to participate in that um, phone call because I could do a three-way call with a doctor. And it was fine. We were able to have a conversation with the doctor, have a telemedicine visit that met my mother's needs as the patient and provided a good opportunity for discussion with the, uh, with the doctor. So I think we do have these technologies. We have people in the world who are unable to access all forms of the technology. So we need to think about multiple levels of technology that we can use. We shouldn't be restricting them. And we should also be thinking about people who don't want to have a face-to-face. -face. There are a lot of people that feel uncomfortable. My, my young adult kids would prefer to text or have a uh, consultation via 
uh, an online consultation with somebody or maybe a phone call, but let's not limit ourselves in this. It's the 21st century and we need to take full advantage of these opportunities to meet the needs of the patients where they're at. Thank you. And yeah, this is Greg Fling. I'm, uh, I practice with MD Live um, across, the, across the country and almost basically do exclusively telehealth. And I would agree with the last two uh, uh, commenters. Um, you know, I don't know where on this it also includes, you know, there are hybrids too, right? So for instance, someone can do a telephone call and they have preloaded, uploaded pictures of an eye or skin issue, right? So that, depending upon the chief complaint, a phone only with photos put into our system is, is, more, is really, in fact, the resolution of those photos are much better than it can get on video. And I would also, um, having done councils like this all over the country in rural areas where you have poor connections, the video sometimes gets very, very tedious or doesn't work at all. And uh, you have to switch over to a phone only and ask patients to upload photos and then reschedule with them. So I don't know, I got in here a little bit late, so I don't know if in your, in the, your, the document it includes that, I'm gonna call that a hybrid. So it's an audio with uploaded photos. Hi, this is Tori Lalamont. I'm general counsel at 98.6, and uh, we are based in Seattle, uh, although we practice in all 50 states. Uh, and so I, I, I just wanted to kind of chime in around this uh, discussion about what is and was not telemedicine and, and what's included. And, uh, I, and in the, <clears throat> my company, as, as well as the American Telehealth Association, um, HIMSERS, and, and, and I know a, a good amount of others, would advocate for a technology uh, agnostic approach to how we define telemedicine uh, for, for a lot of these reasons. I mean, restricting it to uh, video is, is problematic because of the role uh, factor. Um, and, and I think that also it closes people off to getting care that, um, you know, can't have a private setting, you know, maybe they're on the go phone, or in our case, we, we deliver care primarily through text is often much more convenient and um, and we, we do leverage other technologies in the way we deliver care. Uh, we do, uh, you know, photos if, if we're trying to look at something. We do have the ability to switch over, our, our doctors will switch over to video um, if they need to visualize something going on with the patient or, or they could also use telephone. Um, so I, I really think that, you know, our our experience in this space has really shown we can deliver high quality care via text. It's just that obviously not everything is appropriate for text only. Um, and, and so I really think it should be about or our approach uh, would be more sound if it's about ensuring doctors are um, using whatever technology is most appropriate to assess what's going on with the patient and and getting them appropriate quality care. And um, and I have. I, one of my one of my physician colleagues, uh, Dr. Jug Kugel, on the line as well, and and he can certainly speak to quality um, and and really how you know we have been able to have a solid quality approach to care uh, with with this different modality than what we've uh, than what we've conventionally thought about as telemedicine. So Judd, if you are on, if you wanted to just uh, share any any comments about uh, quality, that'd be appreciated. Sure. Sure, thanks, Tori. Can you hear me okay? Okay, um, so I'm Judd Hugel, um, Director of Pediatrics at 98.6, and th this is a really good conversation, and it's an important conversation. Um, there's a, a lot of layers here that I wanna hit on, but to speak to some of the last comments about text-based medicine, can you practice quality text-based medicine? Um, in many ways, so I, I was in a brick and mortar primary care practice, um, one of the partners here in Seattle. I, I came to 98.6 uh, about two and a half years ago. At that time, patients were craving text-based medicine um, and I was actively practicing it on a daily basis with a portion of patients, but then also with you know friends and families and um, numerous uh, colleagues who have kids. Uh, pediatrics in particular is very amenable to it, that the dynamic of question and answer and 
obtaining an authentic history to be able to hone in on what you need. There's definitely a point where you need to do a physical examination in certain cases where that needs to be eyeballs on the child physical exam. Um, and in those instances, we can do that by video. Um, but often, as it's been addressed, a photo of a rash or a photo of, of something that is going on can give you really high resolution data that you need. Um, so I can certainly attest to our ability to practice comprehensive text-based medicine um, and 98.6 in many ways. The other thing to think about is we, with text, you actually have a new quality paradigm. So unlike a brick and mortar clinic where the physician walks into the room with a patient and that, that interaction happens behind closed doors and you don't really know what happened, the physician makes notes about what happened, um, we, through, through chat-based or text-based medicine, we have access to the entire transcript. We have access to every single back and forth between the patient and the physician. We're able to take those transactions and those, those interactions and do a very robust clinical quality analysis. Um, we can do CQA on entire cases and really see into the fullness of those cases. And that, that is very powerful. Um, additionally, we give the patients that transcript. So the, on the patient side, they are seeing the entire back and forth of their encounter. On the physician side, they can always go back and look through and then we can do auditing cycles and we do these auditing cycles um, and have really built up a robust um, clinical quality program around auditing visits and, and acting to improve quality of care. So I'm happy to take any additional questions, but I'll just leave my comments as that for now. And, and if this is appropriate, uh, my name is Kyle Zebley. I'm public policy director for American Telemedicine Association. I thought I would perhaps briefly comment on, on our letter that we sent out uh, as well and um, really just note our, our strong appreciation for the commission's interests in in, in support of uh, telemedicine, and I think we're going to echo a lot of a lot of the comments that we just heard from 98.6, and also from Americans for uh, Vision Care Innovation, from Hims and Hers, and from Teladoc. All those letters as well. Um, I think one of the things that uh, you know we want to highlight here is the is the hope that the commission will be modality neutral in its approach to uh, to telehealth and to telemedicine. And so while we support the commission's efforts to update the telemedicine rules and to implement a consistent regulatory framework, we think that um, the commission's current guidelines uh, are, are a little bit better positioned because the proposed rules, uh, one, narrowly defines telemedicine, as I just mentioned, uh, only through audiovisual technologies, and two, unnecessarily mandates that providers use real-time interactions to establish a valid practitioner patient relationship. Uh, these limitations do not capture how telemedicine providers are increasingly relying on asynchronous or store and forward telehealth technologies to establish patient relationships, perform patient evaluations, and appropriately prescribe medication in many fields. And the ATA has a longstanding position that policies related to tech enabled health delivery should be modality neutral and enable a healthcare professional to practice optimally. Rather than mandating specific telehealth technologies, the commission should develop a regulatory framework that empowers providers to use their clinical judgment. Uh, and of course, we also have a couple of definitions that, that we've utilized uh, at the ATA that we think could be helpful um, as, the, as the commission does its work here. But thank you so much for considering our comments, for including them today, and happy to be a resource to you moving forward. Thank you. This is April Mims. Um, I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at Hims and Hers. And I just wanted to echo from you know the course of comments coming from the ATA, uh, 98.6, uh, as well as, well as Americans for Vision Care Innovation um, in 
pushing for a more expanded definition of telemedicine, especially to incorporate store and forward or asynchronous technologies um, for all of the reasons stated, especially um, as it relates to establishing the patient provider relationship. Um, I think the comments uh, with respect to having a transcript of that conversation are definitely worth noting, especially as we reach out to underserved communities and communities that have traditionally been disenfranchised, frankly, by the healthcare process. Um, the fact that you have a record of that conversation with the provider and an objective process by which you're using evidence-based guidelines and an intake process of getting information is something that appeals to a lot of our um, a lot of our patients that we hear about. Um, so something worth noting, um, as well as the comments about the confidentiality of an asynchronous process. Obviously, you are always establishing the identity of the patient. However, um, at Hims and Hers, we specialize in stigmatized conditions, so sexual health, skin care, hair loss, and we're now moving into behavioral health. And what we hear from our customers is that they appreciate the fact that they have an asynchronous platform um, in order to receive that care, and that's what they're seeking out. So those are just two things that I wanted to highlight. Um, our chief medical officer, Pat Carroll, is not on the line today, but happy to offer him up to talk about the high standard of care um, that we're looking for and all the evidence-based practices that we're using to provide this care. We take it very seriously and we really appreciate the commission taking this time to create this open platform to, for us to speak. A lot of states do not provide this type of you know, way for people to provide input. So thank you for that opportunity. So Hello, I'm um, oh, um, Dr. Kaur. I'd like to change the conversation. No, um, I'd like to change the conversation a bit and go uh, to discuss the artificial intelligence. I would make a recommendation that at this time, any utilization for artificial intelligence is placed on a moratorium now, or eliminated from the language. If it's not possible, I'd like to make the following comments. In a I'm going to present it mainly as, as a physician advocate. So some of this language is extremely concerning. So first and foremost, there should be transparency on what entity is providing the technology for this AI interface. How is this entity chosen as the provider for the technology? Who bears the cost for in implementing this technology? Next one, since it is the providers who are implementing the technology, we should have absolute authority to be able to understand where, how, and who is obtaining the data being used to generate the complex algorithms, and we should be able to determine what needs to be altered. Make no mistake about it, this is meant to supplant initially and then replace it with more powerful. In terms of the use of the ART tools or at the discretion of the licensee, once this is started, more and more pressure will be applied that even though it is at the discretion of the licensee, there will be in essence an elimination of free choice in determining to use it or not. So also the statement really does not make any practical sense. If I'm not going to use the AI tool, why would I license it? Finally, the licensee accepts full responsibility for the diagnosis, treatment plan, and outcomes for the patient based all or in part by the recommendation of the AI tool. It is the duty of those developing these tools and using them on Washington patients to be mindful of bias introduced through flawed data or testing on populations that are not adequate representative. So of note, when it says it should be the licensor accepts full responsibility for the diagnosis, treatment plans, and outcomes. The AI is the provider and the healthcare professional becomes the implementer such as the button pusher, data person entry, who becomes liable. How is it remotely possible that the language being put forth is that the licensee accepts full responsibility? Basically, this makes for the for-profit AI company immune from any damages that will be caused by their software, even though the licensee is paying for it. 
right? It's akin to if I buy a car and operate it according to normal operating standards and the car blows up and kills my family because of a faulty design, is the automotive company that is liable, not me. Anyway, that, that's one of the some main issues I'd like to present. And again, I'd like to state that any use of artificial intelligence at this stage should be placed on a moratorium and eliminated. Thank you very much. So was there anyone else who would like to comment? Uh, this is Tori Lalamont. Um, I'm, again, general counsel at 98.6, and, and we do incorporate artificial intelligence currently in how we provide care. And um, and so we have some kind of firsthand, uh, or we have firsthand experience uh, in this. And, and uh, a couple of things. So, so first, uh, Dr. Kors comments around transparency. Um, I, I think that we we understand and um, echo that, and um, we believe strongly that you know certainly if a physician is going to make a decision about how to care um, about someone, you know transparency is, is a key critical um, thing for them uh, to have access to, so that they can evaluate for themselves if uh, it's appropriate to to go with whatever um, thing is recommended by any AI backed system. Um, but, and I also um, appreciate his comments about um, the, the verbiage as drafted in the rule, um, perhaps almost overstepping in terms of relieving uh, the liability of, of manufacturers or software companies um, if, if phrased this way, uh, where it basically imputes all liability and responsibility onto the physician. Um, I think that there's a really good analogy to be made here around um, not only Dr. Kors' analogy of the car, but I mean, medical professionals right now, they use um, all sorts of medical devices, drugs, uh, you know, all of that. And it, particularly if they're um, prescribing anything to the patient, uh, they, they are charged with ensuring that is an appropriate uh, recommendation or, or, or um, or prescription to issue to their patient in terms of how to care for the health. But ultimately, of course, you know, there's the entire uh, universe of, of products liability um, issues that could be upended if the the language uh, remains precisely as drafted. And so uh, we do have some comments about how we um, would suggest that the, the rule be revised in that regard to, to make it um, uh, what we believe a little bit better fit for kind of walking that line of physician responsibility versus uh, appropriately retaining responsibility on, on the manufacturers or developers of uh, artificial intelligence. I would say, though, I mean, this, this call for um, a moratorium, uh, you know, uh, we, we certainly would disagree with because we feel like we're, we're able to show uh, quite clearly that we are um, Practicing uh, responsible medicine while using it, and, uh, and and a moratorium to solve this, I don't think is is really going to help any anyone. I mean, one of the key things that AI does for us, it drives tremendous efficiency in how we um, uh, it, do some initial intake with our with our patients. Our uh, AI back system asks a bunch of questions of our of our um, patients and gathers a bunch of data. And because of that, our physicians are more efficient. Um, and our physicians, if they're more efficient, uh, we're also able to drive down the cost of care while still meeting every quality standard that you would expect. So um, I think Dr. Hugo, he's still on the line, my colleague, and I, I would invite him to comment a little bit more on, on the quality and, and um, what we've seen while using AI in our practice. Yeah, thanks, Tori. There's definitely the efficiency piece. And I, Dr. Corey, I definitely hear you on, on some of what you're saying. I think from my perspective, I've recognized how physician-led the building of artificial intelligence is, how, just how deeply the physicians are at the center of, of building out those algorithmic pathways. 
Um, and in terms of quality, what, what's really cool to see is the humans are like human physicians practicing were just not able to pick up all of the data points to make the best decision. So if you build a algorithm and you base it on evidence-based up-to-date standards for how to treat a condition or how to diagnose a condition in this instance, it's pretty amazing to see how, you know, in, in testing it out, how the physician would have pursued a different path when you put the algorithmic logic on, all of a sudden it's, aha, uh -huh, oh, this actually is not the condition I was thinking and here's why. And so we really need to think about artificial intelligence as a way of strengthening clinical quality. Um, doctors are not always making the right diagnosis, um, often not making the right diagnosis. We can use technology and AI in particular to strengthen our doctors and augment our doctor's ability to make good, accurate diagnoses. I'd like to comment to that, if you don't mind. So you said that doctors are not making the right decisions often. So let me, I'd like to comment directly to that. First of all, the way the algorithms are determined for AI are based on the physician inputs. So the United States government and all of the insurance companies have been gathering our data for years based off of the AMR. So they've been building algorithms for years. When you get rejection letters from your insurance companies, those are based on AI algorithms. So um, when you, again, that's, a, that's a, a pretty large statement to say that doctors that often make the right decisions. So what would be more helpful, I think, is that, and I've discussed this with insurance companies as well as the government in the past, is that they have the algorithms already there. Instead of having the artificial intelligence programs telling us what to do, there should be a way for us to be able to query those algorithm, those databases within those insurance companies. I'll give you a perfect example. So in patients with multiple sclerosis, and I'm not sure how familiar any of you are with treating, but I'm, I'll just give you a general overview. The treatment of multiple sclerosis has become extremely complex with multiple medications being used where there's been no proven efficacy over one or the other. Now, the literature will eventually bear this out, but it could take maybe a decade before the literature bears it out. However, the insurance companies in the United States government, since they're collecting data from over the nation, are able to determine very quickly who's having the most side effects and who has having the best uh, quality of life. Now, if we're able to query these databases directly, that would be much more helpful than actually having a particular program making decisions and rules where there is no transparency on how those decisions and rules are being made. So I think if you want to put in place, put rules in, the rules should be that we are able to have an interface that directly allows us to query these databases that are already well, well established. And I, again, I'm going back and I'm sorry to beat the point, but you have to remember, it's the doctor's input that are making those decisions for the algorithms. And it's not because the doctors are not often making the correct decisions. Thank you. I think it's a good perspective. I, I don't know all of the nuances of what you're talking about. Um, I'm thinking of this more in terms of clinical algorithms and the use of AI to enhance clinical care. Um, but, and, and the comment is, is not, uh, I, it was a good call out, I think about physicians are not making bad decisions all over, but often incorrect decisions do occur. And, and when you get into this work, you, you see that a lot more clearly. Uh, Okay, last thing. I, I just want to make a, a point for you. So there's a difference between following a decision pathway algorithm. Okay, that's not artificial intelligence. A decision pathway algorithm is basically just determining, like if you come in for a cold, right? So, and then one of the complaints that you're having is your foot, that decision algorithm will kick you out of a cold algorithm and then into a foot algorithm. 
So you, th those are two completely different entities that you're describing. Like when it was discussed earlier that the, the, AI, the AI is asking questions of the provider that makes it more efficient for them. Again, those are just pathway algorithms. That is not artificial intelligence. And I would encourage you to determine what that difference is because we are talking about something that will significantly and fundamentally alter the practice of medicine greater than the way electronic medical records have and more out of our control than electronic medical records. So unless rules are put in place, as I described previously, then there should be a moratorium on the use of artificial intelligence for diagnostic and treatment purposes. Not, and I'm not talking about algorithmic pathways. Thank you. Yeah, and this is Tori from 98.6. I, I think what Dr. Uh, Kor and, and Dr. Hugel are illustrating as they, as they um, have this conversation um, is really the diversity in types of technologies here. Um, and, you know, it, I think Dr. Kor, is, it sounds like you're, you're really focused on this diagnosis piece. And, and I guess the, the way we're coming at it, um, just just uh, to be clear, is um, we use artificial intelligence in ways that don't necessarily tell our, our doctors how to diagnose anybody. Um, I mean, even just the questions that we're asking of our patients, how those questions are identified, it's it's through uh, artificial intelligence in some cases. It's, it's a very um, complex tool and, and different components of our system are leveraging AI and, and some are more of the clinical pathways and um, there's there's uh, other uh, aspects of it that that I probably would uh, defer to our, our our chief technology officer to describe uh, as he will do it better justice than I can. But I, I think the the meta point here that I I would just um, share is I mean defining AI defining technology in medicine statute it, it's it's really clunky and I think that um, to the extent that if if we do opt to um, continue to include this in uh, the role if, if that's determined appropriate I think that um, having some uh, strong perspectives from the technologists that, that build this themselves would be really great to, to solicit feedback on uh, because I think Man, this stuff is is moving so rapidly and it's so complex. And uh, I think that we would be doing our, the patients of Washington State a disservice if we uh, uh, create a rule that um, stifles innovation or use of technology that is ultimately helping people um, and, and can be used safely. So I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but we need to start wrapping things up. We are about to lose one of our commissioners and we have to have three in order to move forward. And this meeting was really only scheduled for one hour. Um, again, this is Amelia, I am the program manager and um, we will have more of these workshops. Um, my email address is on the screen now. It's amelia.boyd.wmc.wa.gov. You can feel free to send me any comments anytime. Um, so we're going to go ahead and close up this workshop because we won't have enough commissioners to move forward. But again, please send your comments to me. I will send out notifications through our Gov Delivery about when we will have another workshop on this subject, um, which will probably be either next month or in December. We want to get this rolling now that we have some uh, comments in. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me directly. And thank you everyone for participating.